Welcome back to The Murder at the Vicarage. We're going to pick up in Chapter 10 today. So last time, Miss Marple got involved in the case, and she shot down Anne Prothero's confession. She said there's no way she could have come into the cottage with um, a gun. She had nowhere to hide it and um, was a witness to her coming and going. And we found out last time also that Lawrence Redding could not have committed the crime the way that he says he did. So... Miss Marple came up with a list of about seven individuals when she counted on her fingers um, that she thinks could be suspects. But um, the police are feeling very frustrated with this new information. And uh, Colonel Melchett, our chief constable, was very upset when he left her cottage. Chapter 10. His remarks on the subject of Miss Marple as we left the house were far from complimentary. I really believe that wizened up old maid thinks she knows everything there is to know and hardly been out of this village all her life. It's preposterous. What can she know of life? I said mildly that though doubtless Miss Marple knew next to nothing of life with a capital L, she knew practically everything that went on in St. Mary Mead. Melchett admitted that grudgingly. She was a valuable witness particularly valuable from Mrs. Prothero's point of view. I suppose there's no doubt about what she says then, eh? If Miss Marple says she had no pistol with her, you can take it for granted that it is so, I said. If there was the least possibility of such a thing, Miss Marple would have been on to it like a knife. Well, that's true enough. We'd better go and have a look at the studio. The so-called studio was a mere rough shed with a skylight. There were no windows, and the door was the only means of entrance or egress. Satisfied on this score, Melchett announced his intention of visiting the vicarage with the inspector. I nodded. I'm going to the police station now. As I entered through the front door, a murmur of voices caught my ear. I opened the drawing room door. On the sofa, beside Griselda, conversing animatedly, sat Miss Gladys Cram. Her legs, which were encased in particularly shiny pink stockings, were crossed. Well, hello, Len, said Griselda. Good morning, Mr. Clement, said Miss Cram. Isn't the news about the colonel really too awful? That poor old gentleman. Miss Cram, said my wife, very kindly came in to offer help to us with the girl guides. Uh, we asked for helpers last Sunday, you remember. I did remember, and I was convinced, and so I knew from her tone was Griselda, that the idea of enrolling herself among them would never have occurred to Miss Cram, but for the exciting incident which had just taken place at the vicarage. I was only just saying to Mrs. Clement, went on Miss Cram, you could have struck me all of a heap when I heard the news. A murder, I said, and in this quiet one-horse village. For quiet it is, you must admit, not so much as a picture house. And then, when I heard it was Colonel Prothero, why, I simply couldn't believe it. He didn't seem the kind, somehow, to get murdered. I don't know what Miss Cram considers are the necessary qualifications for being murdered. It has never struck me that the murdered belonged to any special class, but doubtless she had some idea in her golden shingled head. And so, said Griselda, Miss Cram came round to find out all about it. I feared this plain speaking might offend the lady, but she merely flung her head back and laughed uproariously, showing every tooth she possessed. That's so too bad. You are a sharp one, aren't you, Miss Clement? But it's only natural, isn't it, to want to hear about the ins and outs of a case like this. And I'm sure I'm willing enough to help with the girl guides in any way that you like. But, well, it's exciting. That's what it is. I've been stagnating for a bit of fun. I have. I really have. Not that my job isn't a very good one. It's well paid, and Dr. Stone is quite the gentleman in every way. But a girl wants a bit of life out of office hours. And except for you, Mrs. Clement, who is there in this place to talk to, except a lot of old cats? Well, there's Latisse Prothero, I said. Gladys Cram tossed her head. She's too high and mighty for the likes of me. Fancies herself part of the county set and would demean herself by noticing a girl who had to work for a living. 
Not but what I did hear her talking of, earning a living for herself. And who'd employ her? I should like to know. Why, she'd be fired in less than a week. Unless she went out as one of those mannequins. You know, the models all dressed up and sidling about. I guess she could do that, I expect. She'd make a very good mannequin, said Griselda. She's got such a lovely figure. There's nothing of the cat about Griselda. What was she talking of earning her own living? Miss Cram seemed momentarily discomfited, but recovered herself with her usual archness. Well, that would be telling, wouldn't it? She said, but she did say so. Things are not very happy at home, I fancy. Catch me living at home with a stepmother. I wouldn't sit down under it for a minute. Ah, but you are so high-spirited and independent, said Griselda gravely, and I looked at her with suspicion. Miss Cram was clearly pleased. That's right, that's me all over. Can be led but not driven. A palmist told me that not so very long ago. No, I'm not one to sit down and be bullied, and I've made it clear all along to Dr. Stone that I must have my regular times off. These scientific gentlemen, they think a girl's a kind of machine. Half the time they just don't notice her or remember she's there. Do you find Dr. Stone pleasant to work with? It must be an interesting job if you're interested in archaeology. Oh, of course, I don't know much about it, confessed the girl. It seem, still seems to me that digging up people that are dead and have been dead for hundreds of years isn't, well, it seems a bit nosy doesn't it? And there's Dr. Stone so wrapped up in all that half the time that he'd forget his meals if it wasn't for me. Is he at the Barrow this morning? asked Griselda. Miss Cram shook her head. A bit under the weather this morning, she explained. Not up to doing any work, so that means a holiday for little Gladys. I'm sorry, I said. Oh, it's nothing much. There's not going to be a second death. But do tell me, Mr. Clement, I hear that you've been with the police all morning. What did they think happened? Well, I said slowly, there's still a little uncertainty. Ah, oh, cried Miss, Plant, Miss Cram. Then they don't think it was Mr. Redding after all. So handsome, isn't he? Just like a movie star and such a nice smile when he says good morning to you. I really couldn't believe my ears when I heard the police had arrested him. Still, one always hears they're very stupid, these country police. Well, you can hardly blame them in this instance, I said. Mr. Redding came in and gave himself up. What? The girl was clearly dumbfounded. Well, of all the poor fish. If I committed a murder, I wouldn't go straight off and give myself up. I should have thought Lawrence Redding would have had more sense to give in like that. Why did he kill Prothero? What did he kill him for, did he say? Was it just a quarrel? It's not absolutely certain that he did kill him, I said. But surely, if he says he has, why really, Mr. Clement, he ought to know. Well, he ought to, certainly, I agreed, but the police are not satisfied with his story. But why should he have said he'd done it if he hadn't? That was a point on which I had no intention of enlightening Miss Cram. Instead, I said rather vaguely, I believe that in all prominent murder cases, the police receive numerous letters from people accusing themselves of the crime. Miss Cram's reception of this piece of information was, well, they must be chumps, in a tone of wonder and scorn. She added, I'd never do a thing like that. I'm sure you wouldn't, I said. Well, she said with a sigh, I suppose I must be trotting along. She rose. Mr. Redding accusing himself of a murder will be a bit of news for Dr. Stone. Is he interested? Asked Griselda. Miss Cram furrowed her brows perplexedly. Well, he's a strange one. You can never tell with him. He's all wrapped up in the past. He'd a hundred times rather look at a nasty old bronze knife out of one of those humps in the ground then he would see the knife of Cripping cut up his wife with, supposing he had a chance to see it. Well, I said, I must confess that I agree with him. Miss Cram's eyes expressed incomprehension and a slight contempt. 
Then, with reiterated goodbyes, she took her departure. Not such a bad sort, really, said Griselda as the door closed behind her. Terribly common, of course, but one of those big, bouncing, good-humored girls that you can't dislike. I wonder what really brought her over here. Curiosity. Yes, I suppose so. Now, Len, tell me all about it. I'm simply dying to hear your news. I sat down and recited faithfully all the happenings of the morning. Griselda interpolated the narrative with little exclamations of surprise and interest. And so it was Anne, Lawrence was after all along, and not Latisse. How blind we've all been. That must have been what old Miss Marple was hinting at yesterday, don't you think so? Yes, I said, averting my eyes. Mary entered. There's a couple of men here, come from a newspaper, so they say. Do you want to see them? No, I said, certainly not. Refer them to Inspector Slack at the police station. Mary nodded and turned away. And when you've got rid of them, I said, come back in here. There's something I want to ask you. Mary nodded again. It was some few minutes before she returned. Had a job getting rid of them, she said, persistent. You never saw anything like it. Wouldn't take no for an answer. I expect we shall be a good deal troubled with them lately. Now, Mary, what I want to ask you is this. Are you quite certain you didn't hear a shot yesterday afternoon? The shot what killed him? Well, no, of course I didn't. If I had done, I should have gone in to see what had happened. Yes, but I was remembering Miss Marple's statement that she had heard a shot in the woods. I changed the form of my question. Did you hear any other shots? One down in the woods, for instance. Oh, that, the girl paused. Yes, now I come to think of it, I believe I did hear it. But not a lot of shots, just one. Strange sort of bang it was. Exactly, I said. Now what time was that? Time? Yes, time. Oh, I couldn't say. I'm, I'm sure well after tea time. I, I do know that. Can't you get a little nearer than that? No, I can't. I've got my work to do, haven't I? I can't go on looking at clocks the whole time, and it wouldn't be much good anyway. The alarm loses a good three quarters every day. And what with putting it on and one thing and another, I'm never exactly sure what time it is. This perhaps explains why our meals are never punctual. They are sometimes too late and sometimes bewilderingly early. Was it long before Mr. Redding came? No. No, it wasn't long. Ten minutes? A quarter of an hour? Not longer than that. I nodded my head satisfied. Is that all? said Mary. Because what I mean to say is I've got the joint in the oven and the pudding boiling over as likely as not. That's all right. You can go on. She left the room and I turned to Griselda. Is it quite out of the question to induce Mary to say sir or ma'am? I've told her, but she just doesn't remember. She's just a raw girl, mind you. I'm perfectly aware of that, I said, but raw things do not necessarily remain raw forever. I feel a tinge of cooking might be induced in Miss Mary. Well, I don't agree with you, said Griselda. You know how little we can afford to pay a servant. If once we got her smartened up and all, she'd leave. Well, naturally, she'd get higher wages. But as long as Mary can't cook and has these awful manners, well, we're safe. Nobody else will have her. I perceived that my wife's methods of housekeeping were not so entirely haphazard as I had imagined them. A certain amount of reasonable thought had underlaid them. Whether it was worthwhile having a maid at the price of her not being able to cook and having a habit of throwing dishes and remarks at one and the same, with disconcerting abruptness, was a debatable matter. And anyway, continued Griselda, you must make allowances for her manners being worse than usual just now. You can't expect her to feel exactly sympathetic about Colonel Prothero's death when he jailed her young man. Did he jail her young man? Yes, for poaching. You know that man, Archer. Mary has been walking out with him for two years. Oh, I didn't know that. Darling Len, you never know anything. That's strange. 
It's strange that everyone says the shot came from the woods, I said. I don't think it's strange at all, said Griselda. You see, one so often does hear shots in the woods. So naturally, when you do hear a shot, you just assume as a matter of course that it is in the woods. It probably just sounds a bit louder than usual. Of, of course, if you were in the next room, you'd realize it, that it was in the house, but from Mary's kitchen and the window right on the other side of the house, I don't believe you'd ever think such a thing. The door opened again. Colonel Melchett's back, said Mary, and that police inspector is with him, and they say they'd be glad if you'd join them. They're in your study. And that's the end of chapter 10. Join me next time, guys, as we continue on finding out who committed the murder in the vicarage. Bye.